welcome everyone. I don't want to um, uh, I don't want to chill the conversation uh, unduly. We'll have a chance later to carry on, um, but it's. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Um, always nice to have people come come uh, together for the uh, Osgood Colloquium and Law, Religion, Social Thought. And so nice to see so many uh, familiar faces back. Um, today is our uh, our fourth uh, talk in the um, Osgood Colloquium, and I'm delighted to welcome a good friend and a wonderful scholar, uh, Professor Richard Moon from the. Um, University of Windsor. Um, many of you have read his work on freedom of expression, where he's one of the leading um, theorists and uh, analysts of, of, uh, of expression law in Canada. Um, published the constitutional protection of, of uh, uh, constitutional protection of freedom of expression in 2000, and a whole um, raft of articles that really made him an important contributor on constitutional theory. In, in Canada, and then he turned his mind to uh, religion increasingly over the years, and um, that's when we got to, to know one another, and he's been just a key f voice in the field in uh, law and religion, freedom of religion, and published um, this volume early in kind of the days of writing about um, freedom of religion in Canada, law and religious pluralism in Canada, that brought a community of people thinking about these things together. Um, and I was lucky enough to get to know him a little bit in that context. And so he's really the perfect person to come together to speak uh, today about issues of expression, of course, an important part of it, um, religion, identity, and we're uh, uh, tremendously fortunate to have uh, Dick Moon with us today. So welcome, Dick. <laughs> This room, make, oh, yes, I have a mic on, sorry. This room makes me feel like I'm at a wedding reception or something like that. I should be uh, toasting uh, the bride and the groom here. Well, Ben, thank you so much for inviting me and for your always overly generous words, and uh, they're, they're certainly appreciated. Um, yeah, I mean, the title of this talk is meant to capture something about the intersection of issues of expression, issues of religion. I'm, uh, titles have never been my strong suit, and, um, I, I think that's pretty obvious when you name, when you call a book uh, the constitutional protection of freedom of expression. It's not the kind of thing that people walk past and say, I desperately want to purchase and read that book. So I, in fact, relied on my wife to come up with this title because she's vastly better at that than I am. So I think this um, is a little, makes it sound more interesting than perhaps it will be, but we'll see how that, how that goes. All right, the reality is these days that many recent hate speech cases uh, seem to involve religion, either as the source of views that are alleged to be hateful or as the subject of such views. And sometimes, of course, as both the source and subject of these views. I'm going to focus in this talk on when religion is the subject of speech that is alleged to be hateful in some way. And if I have time, which I'm almost certainly not going to, have, I might say a little bit about when religion is the source of such views. Uh, as you probably know, and I won't say a lot about this, uh, in Canada, hate speech is the subject of restriction under criminal law, uh, the hate promotion provisions in the criminal code, um, ban on the promotion of genocide, the incitement of hatred against an identifiable, identifiable group, and so forth. As well, there are, for the time being, Human Rights Code restrictions on hate speech. I guess Section 13 of the Canada Human Rights Act is still notionally on the books, but it may be gone fairly soon. There are provincial human rights codes that, um, that prohibit communication that is likely to expose the members of an identifiable group to hatred or contempt. Um, we are, of course, waiting for a Supreme Court of Canada judgment concerning the Saskatchewan provision, and in fact, it seems long overdue, and so I don't know what the result of that will be, but for the time being, we have then human rights code restrictions. The Criminal Code of Canada also restricts still blasphemous libel. This has not been uh, utilized for some time, and again, whether it would be constitutional, it seems unlikely, but it's still there on the books. The reality is that most countries uh, have laws that restrict hatred or the vilification of religious groups or belief systems, and these laws can take very different form. Um, sometimes, um, 
There are laws that are just general hate speech laws or vilification laws of different kinds, and religion is one of the listed grounds or religious groupings. Sometimes there are laws that are specifically direct designed and directed at uh, prohibiting uh, hatred directed at a religious group. And in fact, some jurisdictions, as you know, also ban more specific forms of racial or religious hatred, for example, Holocaust denial. Now, most of the leading Canadian hate speech cases involve anti-Semitic speech. The most famously, the Keegstra case and the Taylor case. The Keegstra case upholding, of course, the criminal code prohibition on the willful promotion of hatred, and Taylor upholding Section 30, 13 of the Canada Human Rights Code. Now, of course, um, Christians have sometimes felt that they have been subjected to malicious or hateful attacks, but there are in Canada no significant modern cases on that. In Europe, there certainly are cases dealing with hatred or vilification of, or speech that's alleged to be so, uh, Christian groups. Famously, uh, a number of cases under the now repealed British blasphemy law. Um, as well uh, in, Austra in, Australia, in Austria, the famous Otto Preminger Institute case in which uh, it was found that the Austrian penal code had been breached when a film was shown that uh, depicted um, G uh, God as senile, Jesus as, uh, as uh, an ignoramus, and Mary as a loose woman, and so forth. And there have certainly been a number of other cases, and I may have occasion to mention some of those in the course of, of my, remaining, my remaining remarks. Now, in the last several years, there have been a number of high profile profile cases in Canada involving anti-Muslim speech or speech that attacks or ridicules Islam. The best known of these, of course, was the Human Rights Code complaint made against Maclean's magazine and Mark Stein. In, in that uh, publication, as you may know, uh, Mark Stein says a variety of things, but most significantly, uh, made the claim, the assertion, the suggestion that there was a strong link between uh, Muslims and violence, that Muslims in Europe were uh, seeking to bring about Sharia law, the imposition of Sharia law, uh, uh, in different European jurisdictions and were prepared to use violence as a means to achieve that end. The complaint against Stein uh, was um, uh, unsuccessful, both at, uh, under the Canada Human Rights Act. The commission decided the complaint did not have enough substance and did not go to tribunal. And of course, in British Columbia, there is no longer a human rights commission, like in Ontario, that filters out complaints. So the complaint against Stein went to the tribunal, but they ultimately decided that the speech in that case did not breach uh, the, the relevant provision in the British Columbia Code. Another well-publicized Canadian case was the complaint made uh, against the, um, uh, gosh, the Western Standard and Ezra Levant when that publication, no longer existing, uh, published the so-called Danish cartoons. That complaint was also dismissed. Uh, while neither of these complaints uh, succeeded, there have been more vitriolic attacks on Muslims that have resulted in conviction under the criminal code a case called Harding, in which a Christian pastor published uh, several letters in which he asserted that Muslims were, uh, were conspiring to take over Canada, uh, and they were prepared to use violent, uh, violent means to do so. Now, in Europe, of course, in the last decade, in particular, there have been um, a significant number of, uh, of critical and perhaps hateful forms of speech directed uh, at Muslims. The most famous, perhaps, recent example, well, of course, the Danish cartoons, and there were a number of complaints made concerning the Danish cartoons in different European jurisdictions, but they were uh, invariably dismissed. Uh, a more uh, interesting and prominent complaint was made against, in, in the Netherlands, against the Dutch MP Gerd Wilders, and he was acquitted of the charge of hate speech. He had produced a film called, and I don't know how to pronounce this, uh, Fitna, uh, again, in which he um, 
made a number of claims about Islam, its connection with violence, and so forth. Now, there are obvious reasons why religion or religious communities have been the focus of hate speech. Um, religious commitment is deeply rooted, shapes the adherence worldview, and so may generate social conflict, certainly conflict that sometimes seems intractable. Um, significantly, religious beliefs, uh, although deeply held, can involve claims about what is true and right, and sometimes these claims have public implications. And in a multicultural, multi-faith society like Canada, in which there is interaction between different groups, there is plenty of opportunity for uh, conflict. And indeed, some of this conflict may be an extension of conflicts that are occurring elsewhere in the world. And yet, at the same time, I think it's also true that there are religious communities that are quite insular in character. And to those who are not members of those groups, they can seem often mysterious, irrational, and as a result, a certain element of fear and resentment can be generated. Now, I think these religion cases are difficult for the reason that all hate speech cases are difficult. There's significant disagreement in the community about whether and to what extent the restriction of hate speech can be reconciled with a commitment to freedom of expression. But I think there's also another reason why uh, these religion cases are so difficult or contentious. And that has to do with our conception of religious adherence or membership. Well, religious commitment is sometimes viewed as a personal choice or judgment made by the individual, a judgment that is, in theory at least, revisable. Uh, it is also, or sometimes instead, seen as a central element of the individual's identity. Religious belief lies at the core of the individual's worldview. It orients the individual in the world, shapes his or her perception of the social and natural orders, and may provide a moral framework for his or her actions. Religion, of course, also ties the individual to a community of believers and is often the central and defining association in the individual's life. If religion is an aspect of the individual's identity in this way, then when the state treats the individual's beliefs or practices as less important or less true than the practices of others, or when it marginalizes the individual's religious community in some way, then it may be seen as not simply um, rejecting the individual's views and values, but as in some way denying his or her equal worth. This idea of religion as identity lies behind the often uh, at least expressed idea requirement that the state should remain neutral in religious matters. That at least is a formal commitment in many Western liberal democracies. But even if we think that the state is supposed to be neutral towards different religious communities, religious belief systems, it is generally assumed and understood that individuals can take deep and strong positions, often negative positions, about different religious communities. So within the public sphere, that is to say the sphere of public debate, it's generally assumed that religious beliefs can be open to significant challenge. Now, a key distinction in hate speech law has been this distinction between attacks on the believer, the individual or group, which may, in extreme cases at least, amount to hate speech, and attacks on his or her beliefs, which ought not to be subject to any form of restriction. So the distinction between belief and believer. The criticism of an individual's views and opinions is understood to lie at the core of free speech and what we think ought to be protected. The ban on hate speech, then, should apply only to assertions that the members of an identifiable group necessarily share a certain trait, a certain undesirable trait that makes them dangerous or undesirable. Something like, they are dishonest, they are violent, something along those lines. Now, there are, I think, two, <laughs> two difficulties with this distinction, this distinction between belief and believer. One subject to hate speech regulation if it's extreme, the other not. And both of these problems, these difficulties, I think, stem from 
our complex conception of religious adherence, our understanding of it as both choice, personal commitment on the one hand, and on the other hand, cultural identity. The first has to do with the attribution of belief to the members of a religious group, or more generally, with the idea, with the, the relationship between the individual and his or her religious tradition, or the belief system with which he or she associates. The complex link between the individual and his or her religious beliefs may make it difficult often to distinguish between an attack on the believer, on the individual or his or her group, and an attack on, on beliefs per se. The second difficulty with this distinction is that because religious beliefs are so deeply held, are so much a matter of the individual and how much and how she or he understands themselves. Because they concern that which is sacred, an attack on the individual's beliefs, on the beliefs they actually hold, may be experienced very deeply and very personally. And that has led some, that recognition has led some to argue that religious beliefs should be insulated from at least some forms of criticism because they are so deeply held. Well, let me say a little bit then about each of these uh, difficulties, beginning with the uh, attribution problem, as I would describe it. Hate speech makes the claim that the members of a racial or other identifiable group share a dangerous or undesirable, treat, de undesirable trait, that they are by nature violent or dishonest, a claim of that kind, and so must be stopped by violent means if necessary. Our commitment to equality involves a rejection of such claims as false. And much of the hate speech that is directed against religious groups takes this very basic, simple form. Certain traits, such as greed, dishonesty, or cruelty, are falsely attributed to the members of a particular group, a religious group in some cases, and treated as essential characteristics of membership in that group, sometimes as even genetically based in some ways. And this is easier to do, indeed, when we're talking about uh, groups that are understood or traditions that are understood as inherited in some fashion. Now, the attribution, however, of undesirable traits to the members of a religious group is often less direct than this, not quite so simple and straightforward. The speaker may associate the members of the group with a dangerous or undesirable belief and do so on the basis of uh, a literal reading of the group's scripture or uh, an expressed view of fringe elements of that particular religious tradition. Often the attack then is on a particular belief. A particular belief is objectionable, but the implication is that the members of a religious tradition that includes such a belief are dangerous or undesirable. If the members of the group share a belief that violence against non-members is justified, for example, to advance the group's goals, then the members of that group are deserving of not just suspicion, but perhaps contempt, even hatred. And of course, it's true that the beliefs we hold reveal something about us, either because we have chosen those beliefs or because they define us in some fashion. But of course, it's also true importantly, that the beliefs of religious community are invariably subject to contest. An individual may understand him or herself as a member of a community without sharing the same beliefs as all other members of that tradition, of all individuals who identify or associate themselves with that, with that tradition. Um, and indeed, it might be often difficult to identify a shared set of beliefs except in very abstract terms of any religious community. So the mem and, and as well, of course, the members of a religious community may identify with a religious tradition or belief system in very different ways, with very different levels of commitment and degrees of involvement. And in fact, I think this is a reminder of this complex way in which in which people identify with religious traditions as both personal commitment and cultural identity. So I may associate myself with a, a religious community without, or tradition, without agreeing 
with many of its official views and certainly without agreeing with the views that are held by some that may be understood as more marginal or fringe in that community. Now hate speech then in this context tends to treat certain beliefs associated with the group and as I say most often with a fringe element of that group as aspects of each believer's identity. In doing this it erases the space for contest and judgment within the religious tradition and the distinction between belief and believer. The hate speaker ties all group members to the dangerous belief he or she has identified. They, as is sometimes said, racialize the group itself. The undesirable beliefs become the equivalent of traits, characteristics uh, of the believer, him or herself. Now, at the same time, what can happen is the, the hate speaker can try to avoid the charge of hate speech, can be a little bit elusive by insisting that their claim is about belief and not about believers. So they, they reintroduce the distinction after seeking to uh, erode it or collapse it. So um, I think I can get away with this description without being defamatory. Sophisticated bigots like Mark Stein are skilled at blurring the line between criticism of a particular belief that may be held by some, as I say, fringe members in a religious tradition and attacks on the entire religious group. So when Stein refers to uh, Muslim support for violence and the growth of the Muslim population uh, in the West, the group is pr presented as homogenous. It's just this is, how, this is how Muslims are in the West. And at the same time, however, he slips in his, what he described as his obligatory of courses, seeming to acknowledge the diversity of opinion in the community itself. So he says things like, of course not all Muslims support violence, but he frames this as, I am required to say this in some fashion. Uh, not all Muslims support terrorism, says Stein, but plenty of them do. And in the context of this piece, this is almost as comforting as, well, not all gays are pedophiles, or not all Jews are crooks, or whatever. It's as if it's the exception that proves the rule in some fashion. Stein's caveat, though, allows him to say, well, he's not making a claim about all Muslims when it's necessary, when it's convenient for him to make that claim. He's making a claim, he's suggesting he's making this claim generally, but there are exceptions. I think the complex character of religious adherence, the way we understand it as cultural identity and personal judgment, allows bigots like Stein to associate Muslims with violence as almost a character trait, well formerly in this token fashion, acknowledging that there may be some exceptions to it. Stein in this piece, um, Makes, doesn't make any theological claims about Islam. In, in fact, you're kind of given, you're given the sense that it's not so much about Islam here, it's almost as if violence is encoded in the Arab character or something along those lines. I mean, if I have time, just a, a, you know, a quick reference to the text of his book. Oh, let me say quickly, I don't know if people have come across the book by Doug Saunders called, uh, the, uh, what is it called, The Myth of the Muslim Tide. It's a terrific book. It's, I mean, it's a very factual book, but it really effectively refutes so many of the claims that are in, made in the literature he describes as Muslim tied literature, which Stein is, you know, a, 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 certainly in Canada, the principal exponent. Well, Stein at one point, um, and this is, you know, this is that sort of propaganda device of associating different things without actually showing that they are truly linked, but you just juxtapose them and somehow it's as if they are linked. Tells the story about an assault on a bus driver, a streetcar driver in a city in Belgium. And he talks about how these, you know, young, these young men came onto the bus, they were harassing different people, the bus driver sought to intervene, and these young men assaulted this, this uh, bus driver. And I think, actually, I think he may, have, he may have died as a result. So it was a very serious, serious incident. Well, in any event, Stein then says, and surprise, surprise, they were Moroccan. This is how he kind of throws it in. And you're reading this, and it's coming in the context of a series of claims about Islam and Muslims and violence. And you're thinking, so what is the link here? 
I'm, I would be very surprised to discover that these young men were devout Muslims who were assaulting this bus driver in order to advance the cause of Islam. You know, and no such claim is made, but it's just placed within that context as if somehow these are all linked and one is to flow from another. Instead, this is just another tragic story of alienated young men who vent, who express, uh, you know, take violent action at different times and unfortunately seems to exist across cultures. In any event, that's just an example of this sort of device that appears within this literature. All right, Gerd Wilders, in contrast, does make theological claims uh, about Islam, the claim that Islam supports violence and points to different passages within the Quran, as if he is in the position to, um, you know, to discuss theologically the meaning of the Quran and Islam. Well, Wilders looks then at the religion as, and, and, and sees within it a source for these beliefs and actions which he understands to be violent and discriminatory. So according to Wilders, a, a true Muslim by the standard of, of the faith must accept the legitimacy of violence against the infidel. Well, of course, as we all know, within any religious tradition, it's possible to find support for acts that I think most of us today would consider to be entirely unacceptable. It's certainly possible to find within the Bible many passages that are deeply disturbing and can be understood as supporting violence against outsiders to the religious community. But for Wilders, Islam has a single meaning, and that meaning includes support for violence. Violence is an essential part of the faith. So, um, yeah, so what he does, of course, is, again, erase this space for contest and disagreement about doctrine and the possibility of stronger and weaker associations within the tradition. That's all collapsed. And the Quranic interpretation of a fringe part of the community becomes the essence of Islam and the identi identity of its, ad its adherence of anyone who would describe him or herself as a Muslim. Both Stein and Wilders, in very different contexts, very different jurisdictions, were acquitted of hate speech charges, uh, in part, I think because they were able to claim that they were attacking beliefs and not believers or not a community per se. Um, and both showed, I think, some skill in blurring this line between attacks on belief and attacks on believer, moving at different points to one rather than the other. And as I say, I think they're helped in this by our, our own complex view of religion as judgment and identity. They can, acclaim, they can claim to be attacking only beliefs, which some people may adopt while trying to tie these beliefs to a tradition or a community, to an identity of some kind. I think there are other reasons why um, Stein, for example, was found not to have breached the hate speech provisions. If hate speech laws are directed at ex Here's one way, I should say. If hate speech laws are directed at extreme expression, uh, speech, that, speech that's directed at a group that has, in recent history, been the target of organized campaigns of violence, are more likely, that's more likely to be classified as hate speech. I mean, we all know what expressions, phrases like the solution to the Jewish problem mean, or what a what a symbol like the swastika signifies, or what a burning cross means. We know what those means and we link them, we tie them to fairly recent history of violent persecution against different groups. But in the case of expression that may be viewed as harsh, vitriolic in some way, made about other identifiable groups that don't have the same history of at least fairly recent violent persecution, it may be harder to discern a violent purpose and to separate extreme from the more tragically mainstream forms of discriminatory speech. This though, I wonder whether this may be changing with regard to the Muslim community. The absence of a history of systemic and violent oppression of Muslims in Canada and more generally in the West uh, may make the purpose uh, and possible effect of anti-Muslim or anti-speech less obvious. 
uh, we're less likely to see the speech as calling for violence when that violence seems abstract or distant. And I wonder, though, whether this is changing and changing quickly when one thinks about instances like the mass murder in Norway and uh, involving uh, Andres Breivik, who himself made reference to a number of um, a number of publications in the Muslim Thai tradition, including Mark Stein, who very quickly sought to distance himself from those actions. I wonder whether we ought then and are more likely now to see um, the writings of somebody like Stein uh, as having a more obvious message as calling for violence. After all, if you think about what Stein has said, what should you take away from it? Given if, if Muslims represent a threat in Europe, and I guess in theory elsewhere, but numbers don't warrant apparently in North America, if they rep truly represent a threat and uh, are prepared to use violence to impose Sharia law, then surely radical action is justified to prevent that from occurring. That would be the obvious uh, implication if you were to take seriously the claim made by Stein and others. So I think that's the first reason why Stein perhaps escapes, or has to this point escaped, the uh, successful uh, allegation of hate speech. And that is, it doesn't look like it's extreme because we don't have that same recent history of violence against Muslims. But as I say, I think that may be changing. I think the other reason is the tone of Stein's writing is not hateful or vitriolic in character. And in determining whether speech violates hate speech laws, there has been, I think, an undue focus on the hateful tone or style of the speech itself. But when you look at Stein's writing, again, he has a light and sometimes humorous style. His purpose seems to be to awaken Western audiences to the threat of Islam, the threat of Muslims. And again, any reader who takes seriously his message would have to conclude that extreme action is justified. I think it's been a mistake to focus so much on tone, on style, and not actually on the content of what's said. And indeed, um, it is sometimes the very uh, humorous and light character, the kind of sometimes glib quality of the writing of somebody like Stein that may make um, his ability to pass these messages on more effective. Now, I have to add a caveat about Stein. I, I don't know whether he thinks any of this. It's the same as what I think about Ezra Levant. I don't know what they actually think or believe and how much it's just a matter of self-promotion, being provocateur of some kind, and it's very difficult to know. I suspect they have a kind of crude right-wing position and are prepared to say anything to support it, indifferent entirely to what may be the facts or what may be true and untrue. Um, I, I took some pleasure a number of years ago when Ezra Levant I, I was much younger than I am now, described me as a 60-something professor in the sunset of my career. And I thought, well, fortunately, and well, I'm closer to 60 now. I was then quite a long way away from it. But I thought, and had he ever met me, I might have been upset by this, but he hadn't met me, so I thought, okay, it's not founded on anything whatsoever. Okay. Now that, all of that was really meant to say something about what I've described as the first difficulty with this distinction between belief and believer, attacks on the individual and attacks on the beliefs he or she actually holds. A distinction that is, I think, central to our understanding of, of hate speech law. And so I think that first problem then is, what, is it, what does it mean to attack the belief exactly when the individual has such a so deeply associated with a set of beliefs, and how easy it is to slip between the two and blur the line. Now, the second difficulty, I think, between this distinction between belief and believer is that religious beliefs and commitments are so deeply held often, sometimes, that an attack on the individual's beliefs, on the belief they actually hold in this instance, um, or the things they regard as sacred or worthy of veneration, affects the believer, affects the individual very deeply, very profoundly. Now, there are different ways to understand the objection to the Danish cartoons or earlier Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verse Verses. I mean, one objection was that they reinforced Western stereotypes about Muslims as violent or backward and were directed at a uh, non-Muslim or Western audience. 
But I think the principal complaint in, in these cases and in others is that matters that were sacred or worthy of veneration to the members of a religious community were ridiculed, they were disparaged, they were mocked, and that was experienced in a, as, a, as a, a deeply offensive, deeply hurtful thing. And certainly Christians have objected to different depictions, in particular of, of Jesus, for the same reason. Most famously, the artist Sereno's um, uh, photograph of um, entitled Piss Christ of a Jesus on a crucifix immersed in the artist's urine was in the source of much controversy in different contexts. The public wrong, if we can, call, if we can try to use the language of public wrong in these cases then, is for some understood, is some that speech that's insulting or hurtful to those who hold sorry, is that speech is insulting or hurtful to those who hold certain things sacred or worthy of veneration. Uh, the prophet in Islam and in Christianity, the um, son of God. Now, I should say quickly, I think that it can often be difficult to distinguish this experience of injury or hurt from more general concerns about the marginalization of a religious particular minority religious community within um, a, a, a larger uh, community. All right, now the protection of religious sensibilities has at least in the recent, in relatively recent time, been the focus of blasphemy law in its modern form, we might say. Blasphemy law in the West, uh, once upon a time, banned the denial of the truth of Christianity and in the 19th century, the law, though, was interpreted more narrowly as a ban on intemperate attacks on the Christian faith. Uh, and more recently, some commentators had suggested that, well, perhaps blasphemy law scope should be enlarged. We don't know exactly what it might be in Canada. In the UK, it was understood to simply protect mainstream Christian faith, certainly that tied with Anglicanism. And so some argued that perhaps all religions should be protected from this kind of injury or insult. Instead, of course, what occurred in the UK was a repeal of the blasphemy law, but there are similar laws still on the books in some jurisdictions, and indeed Ireland continues to have a blasphemy law. Now, whether or not in the form of a broadly interpreted hate speech law, an updated blasphemy law, or some kind of more particularized law aimed at preventing insult to religious belief or religious communities, there has certainly been some support, some suggestion that it would be uh, appropriate to have a ban on the ridicule or intemperate criticism of religion in order to protect believers from uh, insult to their deepest convictions. And a ban on criticism of this kind or ridicule could be seen as a middle ground, a middle position. It recognizes both that religious adherence is a personal commitment to certain truths that have to be open to debate and contest in some way. And on the other hand, that it's also an aspect of the individual's identity that ought to be treated with some respect. So perhaps this can represent, offer some kind of middle ground. Well, I think uh, whatever attempts might be made to find some middle ground, it's ultimately unworkable. <coughs> and I think it's unworkable for three uh, well, probably quite closely related reasons. The first is it is awfully difficult to define enforceable standards of civility in public discourse, and I think almost impossible to do so when talking about uh, religion and the criticism of religion. Secondly, and I'm gonna get to each one of those in more detail in a minute. Secondly, if a, a restriction on intemperate criticism of religious belief rests on the idea that religious belief is deeply rooted, and that's why it ought to be protected and respected in some fashion, we might wonder about the effectiveness of temperate or reasoned critique of religion. And thirdly, while we might sometimes see religion as a matter of culture and identity, it does involve truth claims. And more significantly, these truth claims uh, sometimes, perhaps often, have public implications and as a result must be open to, subject to criticism that's deeply felt and sometimes very harsh in character. So first, how am I for time? I'm good, okay, all right, good. First then, the problem with civility standards. Well, freedom of expression, something I have 
feels like another life. I've argued at another time, another place. Freedom of expression doesn't simply protect individual liberty from state interference. It protects the individual's freedom to communicate with others. The right of the individual is to participate in an activity that's deeply social in character. So expression or communication is, in many respects, a relationship between the speaker and an audience. And of course, as such, it can be compromised in a variety of ways. That relationship can be undermined or compromised by manipulation and deceit, but perhaps also by incivility, by ridicule, and so forth. But standards of civility, of respectful discourse, are conventional and difficult to establish in a multicultural or multi-faith community. Free expression must protect speech that challenges social norms of different kinds, and that may include, um, uh, that may include norms concerning social respect and uh, appropriate forms of, of address. And I think Robert Post has powerfully uh, made this argument. I suppose I would disagree with him, because I think there are probably some limits to this, uh, although I'm not sure he would take issue with this, most obviously in different social and institutional contexts where we do expect and sometimes demand uh, a level of civility within discourse and exchange. And of course, we also have come to recognize or accept that the emotional force of speech, including anger and outrage, um, may be an important part of expression and may have value, and that's something I'll come back to in a minute. And so while freedom of expression may protect a communicative relationship, there must sometimes be a conflict or tension within that relationship, a degree of incivility. Well, if it's difficult to establish civility rules in public discourse generally, it is almost impossible to do so when religion is the subject of debate. As I noted earlier, um, at the core of hate speech, excuse me for a sec, at the core of hate speech is a claim that's false. We call something hate speech because at its root, a false claim is being made. Hate speech claims that the members of a racial or other identifiable group share a dangerous or undesirable trait. Again, as I said earlier, that our commitment to equality involves a rejection of these claims as false. And if the false claims are sufficiently extreme, they will be caught by a ban on hate speech. In this way, hate speech law, properly understood, is not about hurt feelings and personal offense. Instead, it's about the spread of dangerous falsehoods, false assertions that may encourage radical or violent action against the members of a target group. The criticism, or the regulation of religious criticism is different though. The state, we're told, is to take no position on the truth of a particular religious belief system. The restriction of religious criticism or ridicule then must be based entirely on not the truth of its claim, the falsity of its claim, I ought to say, but on the impact it has on the feelings or dignity of the religious adherent. The state can't enter into questions of truth or proper practice, so instead, in trying to decide whether or not attacks on religion should be restricted, they have to try to grasp the significance of the belief to the believer. The injury he or she experiences when that, when what she regards or he regards as sacred is ridicule. How do they experience it? How is it, how does it feel? The focus is on the individual believer's feelings, his or her sense of injury. But the believer's experience of injury is tied to his or her belief in the truth of what is being ridiculed. The religious adherent does not object to ridicule because, uh, ridicule of his or her faith because she or he feels hurt by it. They're hurt by it, they object to it, uh, because it mocks that which should be shown respect, that which ought to be venerated and treated as sacred. So offense is taken by the religious adherent to the Danish cartoons or to the Piss Christ or whatever we may be talking about, because what he or she regards as true, what's sacred, is rejected or disparaged in some way. So the public wrong may be framed in subjective terms as offense or insult to dignity, but the subjective experience itself is based on the individual's commitment to something as true. Now, 
That, I think, is only one small problem. The larger problem is it's not clear how the state is to determine when the experience of offense, offense is sufficiently great that the speech ought to be restricted. The standard for the unacceptability of criticism can't be based simply on the reactions or feelings of the adherents, those who are being uh, criticized, and certainly on, not simply on their report of that experience. In fact, different religious traditions have different uh, views about the sacred and will understand and experience criticism or satire in very different ways. And they may have very different views about the obligations of both members, those inside and those outside the religious community, to respect the sacred. And as well, of course, individual believers will relate to their religious tradition in very, very different ways. Now, restrictions then on uh, speech that attacks or challenges, ridicules religious belief has to then be based on some idea of what is a reasonable or ordinary subjective reaction to an attack on religious, to, a, to religious criticism. But there can't be any agreement on this. There's no place outside the faith tradition or the individual's experience of it at which a decision maker can stand and decide what's reasonable, unreasonable, tolerable, or intolerable critique of a particular religion. All right, so that's the, that's the first problem. Defining civility standards seems enormously difficult. The second is, if a restriction on intemperate criticism of religious belief rests on the idea that religion is deeply rooted, then we might wonder about the point or effectiveness of temperate or reasoned critique of religion. How will it work? How, can, how is it to be effective in some way? The reinterpretation of English blasphemy law in the 19th century, which I made reference to earlier, so that it caught only intemperate attacks on the Christian faith, rested on the view that religious beliefs should be subject to reasoned evaluation, that the truth, the truth did not need to be protected from challenge, but Intemperate uh, attacks ought to be restricted because they might distort the search for truth in some fashion. They might displace reason or reflection. And so what was protected then was temperate, respectful challenges or criticism of religious belief. But intemperate, ridicule, disrespectful attacks would not be protected. But today the protection of free speech isn't limited to speech that is rational and temperate in character. Beliefs or opinions that are not religious, at least to start with that, may, according to the contemporary understanding of free speech, be subjected to harsh and intemperate criticism or ridicule. And so the restriction of intemperate attacks on religious belief, if we hold to that now, if we adopt that now, can't be explained um, as part of some general exclusion of irrational or intemperate speech from the scope of uh, uh, freedom of expression. And in fact, the contemporary claim that religious belief should be protected from intemperate criticism rests on a very different understanding of religious belief than that which underlay the redefinition of blasphemy law in the 19th century. Religious beliefs are understood to be so deeply held to be faith-based, a matter of identity rather than judgment, and so they are different from other beliefs and opinions. And that's why they should be protected in a way that may be different from other beliefs and opinions. The religious believer, as I've already noted, is said to experience an attack on his or her beliefs in a very profound and personal way. The problem is that this argument for the insulation of religion from harsh and intemperate criticism might prove too much. It might be seen to justify uh, the insulation of religion from any attack, from any kind of challenge. If religion is viewed as an identity, then any criticism, no matter how politely expressed, might be seen as injurious or insulting in some way. Even if we accept, though, that only intemperate criticism is hurtful enough to justify restriction based on this idea of religion as identity, the problem remains that criticism is either intemperate and therefore hurtful 
or it's reasonable and rational and therefore likely to be ineffective, have no real impact on the religious community of the believer. In words that are at least attributed to Jonathan Swift, he said, it is useless to attempt to reason a man out of a thing he was never reasoned into. And I think this, you know, this recognition could, and I'm not advocating this, but this recognition could support a very different legal position that ridicule, mockery, harsh criticism ought to be permitted uh, because you know, critics of a particular religion might seek to confront or to shock, to shake the believer from his or her unreflective acceptance of certain views or values, or they may simply wish to express to the believer or the larger world there, that is to say, the speaker's sense of outrage or frustration. And this takes me to my third point. So there's the second problem, that is to say, if speech, if, if religious belief is so deeply rooted, then what meaning does rational, what, I'm good, rational, reasonable uh, discourse have? Perhaps the only response can be, you know, anger, outrage, ridicule, something that's meant to provoke or shake individuals, or as I say, just express frustration and outrage. Thirdly, and lastly, um, religious belief involve truth claims that often have public implications. Some members of the general community may have very strong negative reactions to religious beliefs, certainly those that address in some way the rights, their rights, their interests, the rights or interests of others in the larger community. So for example, gays and lesbians may feel some, some uh, negative reactions, some strong feelings about uh, the teachings of certain Christian churches that may impact their lives and prevent them, they may believe, from having full or even uh, safe lives. To this we could add that some of the harshest, most intemperate criticism of religious belief and religious community sometimes comes from those who have formerly understood themselves as associated with that tradition, as ex-members, the ex-Mormon, the ex-Catholic are often the individuals with the strongest and most negative views about a religious tradition. And that leads to the important point that any attempt by the state to protect religious sensibilities may intrude, uh, may, int may mean the state is intruding into debates about religious truth. The complex character of religious adherence uh, can make it difficult to distinguish internal from external religious critique. The state's not supposed to involve itself in internal religious debates in some kind, but if it becomes involved in restricting intemperate attacks or challenges or ridicule of a religious tradition or a set of beliefs, it may find itself interfering uh, with debate within the religious community. Or maybe the more problematic question being what counts as in and outside of the religious community? A difficult question. All that, I think, leads to the conclusion that uh, there are far too many difficulties for the state to become involved in the restriction of intemperate uh, religious criticism or the ridicule of religious belief systems. Now, despite all of this, uh, despite this claim, uh, and my defense, I guess, of open debate on religious matters, I think there are two ways in which some consideration may be given to the significant injury or offense caused by intemperate attacks on religion or ridicule of that which is sacred. First, it may be that a captive audience should be protected from expression that is deeply hurtful. So for example, the burning of a Quran on the steps of a mosque following Friday prayers. That kind of direct, unavoidable confrontation may justifiably be restricted. In this way, the recognition of religion as deeply rooted as an identity may support at least some limited or location-based restriction on the ridicule or denigration of religious symbols. Of course, there's lots of, you know, I'm throwing these out now because there are bound to be lots of problems in defining the scope of any such restriction. The other and perhaps more problematic um, reason to restrict religious criticism sometimes, and I, I recognize I'm, I'm undecided on this, but, but think it's worth, it's worth at least debating or considering. We don't generally hold 
the speaker responsible for the actions of the audience. I mean, the public commitment to freedom of expression rests upon the idea that it is the audience that makes their judgment, their decision about what they hear and take action accordingly. The action might be, I agree and I go out and do something in response, uh, in agreement with the speech, or it could be in negative reaction to the speech, in which I then take to the streets because of my outrage or anger about what's said. But a commitment to free speech has generally meant that we don't hold the speaker responsible for the actions of his or her audience. There are lots of exceptional situations, obviously, famously, the yellow fire in a crowded theater and so forth, in which we think the, the kind of constraints on independent judgment are so significant that we will, in fact, hold the speaker responsible in those sorts of limited circumstances. But generally speaking, we don't. But I think the idea that we don't hold the speaker responsible for the actions of the audience, to some extent, it rests on the idea that we believe that the state generally has the power to intervene and respond to potential uh, harmful actions that an audience may take, to kind of intervene and either punish it if it occurs, but preempt it so that it does not occur. And if we think about it that way, there may be some times and places in which the state does not have the meaningful power to prevent uh, harmful, wrongful actions that may occur in response to speech. And I think in those situations, we have to at least think seriously about whether exceptionally it might be justified or legitimate for the state to prevent uh, certain forms of speech. Now, I say this recognizing all the argument and all the concerns about the heckler's veto, the very idea that you don't want to give the audience an opportunity to effectively shut down a speaker by threatening to engage in violent actions as a response. But I do think it is sometimes a luxury of a stable state, an effective police force, and so forth, to say that um, we will never hold the speaker responsible for the actions of his or her audience, and it's at least worth thinking about or debating. All right, my lar I don't want to detract from my larger conclusion being that uh, religion has increasingly a prominent role in hate speech cases as either the source or the subject of hate speech, and that um, all these cases raise all the familiar and traditional debates and arguments around hate speech. I think there is a, another uh, layer, another dimension to the debate about uh, religion as the source and subject, which is tied to our very complex idea of religion as both uh, personal commitment and cultural identity. Okay, thank you. for questions and um, to thank you so much just the um, reflection on the way in which the hate speech in this context is tied together with the way in which we imagine religious belief as identity as something chosen as something in the person and also a really neat path through thinking about the truth nature of claims or the nature of the truth claims involved in in, re in religious belief I think is really uh, provocative in this area. So we have a couple of mics and I'll hand them over as, as questions come up. Uh, any questions for Professor Moon? Comments, questions? Yeah. Fellow in the back. Uh, thanks, Dick. I really enjoyed that. I have a question that I'm not sure that or a point, a comment, I guess. I'm, I think you'll agree with, but I'm not certain. <laughs> okay. um, I'm used to thinking about these issues through the rubric of anti-discrimination law. Mm -hmm. And so to talk about hate speech cases in an undifferentiated way raises a lot of questions for me. And so when I say I'm used to thinking about it through the rubric of anti-discrimination law, I'm, I'm used to thinking of circumstances in which hate speech is func functioning as a mechanism of social exclusion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, I guess my question is, when there are demonstrable effects of social exclusion in hate speech, and of course we're dealing with speech that's often targeting a group not just by virtue of its religion, but perhaps also its race, race, ethnicity, national origin, it may all be bundled up mm -hmm. together. Um, if there are demonstrable effects of social exclusion, would you disagree that we should be dealing with we should be imposing civil consequences on the, the uh, speakers who are responsible for those effects. And I'm thinking of cases like the Ross case. And mm 
Right. And, it, and it seems to me that what we're debating, I think what we're debating when you're talking about hate speech cases are circumstances where the direct evidence of social exclusionary effects is not present. Um, because if that's not right, then you're, you're saying something more radical, I think, about the current state of the law. Right. No, I don't think I'm saying anything radical about the current state of the law. So, I mean, there's, I guess the question is, you know, I mean, this just returns us to the question of when do we think a speaker is responsible for the events that may occur? And, you know, if we're talking about speech, we usually, you know, we don't sort of draw a nice causal line uh, between the speech and, you know, actions that can somehow be connected or associated with it. So, I mean, if you're talking about cases like Ross and whatever, well, you know, we understand that within a certain institutional context and a certain relationship with students and a certain responsibility and accountability within that institutional framework. So that, that changes it um, in some way. And so we're prepared to view the speech as like action when it's in that framework. So I guess I need to think about, you know, the different you know, institutional locations in which it might occur. I mean, I'm talking about speech understood as public discourse, you know, um, in some, some contribution, whether it's, you know, Stein writing in Maclean's magazine or not. So I don't know. I don't know whether I'm, you know, I'm kind of missing part of what you're saying or, yeah, or you're, just not, you're just too nice first, that's all. No, no, I, I don't think you're missing any, anything at all. It's just, um, uh, we, the category of hate speech is, right. is perhaps not the most yeah. helpful uh, category to work through here because right. uh, there's so much confusion, and again, I'm speaking from the perspective of engaging with anti-discrimination. There's yeah. so much confusion about what uh, is prohibited in our statutes at the federal level and at the provincial level. And people don't draw the distinction between provisions like Section 13, which I guess is repealed or about to be repealed. It's, yeah, uh, House of Commons has voted and the Senate hasn't yet, I think, is where it stands. Right. But, it's, you know, say that goes. So you don't have a freestanding prohibition on hate speech in the Canadian Human Rights Act, mm -hmm. but you still have prohibitions right. on discrimination and yeah. employment, access to housing and services. And, yeah, and, and I a assume lot of hate speech does function as a social, as, an, as a practice of social exclusion in discrete institutional contexts. And, right. and so I just think it's important to make that distinction. Well, oh, no, absolutely. And, and the other context, of course, is this, I'm quite happy, you know, when to consider something hate speech anyway, when this line between belief and believer is, you know, sufficiently collapsed, which I think people like Stein do, you know, despite the attempt to kind of reclaim it at critical points of the argument. So in that regard, too, I also think there's space for limitation. Just, I'm looking around, I'm gonna um, just throw one to you as, as well, Dick, which is, uh, yeah. I just, I, I wonder, there's a, a particular um, scenario, and I wonder if given some of the arguments about um, the capacity of religious beliefs to make a kind of contribution to public debate about public goods, mm -hmm. and therefore there needing to be a kind of response. So I'm imagining extremely insular, small religious communities and whether there's a case to be made at all for a distinction to be drawn or a, a kind of a discernment to be made, right. where communities that are making an effort not to participate in public debate. So you imagine, you know, Wilson Colony or very small right. groups that are insular by virtue of their religious beliefs ought to enjoy a sort of assistance from the state and it, their capacity to kind of hold back from that. I mean, is there some sense in which if a community has made a decision not to participate in that given take, they get take, to drop out of debate. Too. That in a sense that they drop out of debate, yeah. or is that something kind of unappealing as as a notion to you? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, I think you know it might seem more unfair, and I know that in the context of other contexts, when a community sort of removes itself, we might. We might, you know, view notions of accommodation differently. We might view a number of things, but I don't know whether we can view this differently. Whether it's, whether it's still, it might seem unfair to be, you know, mocked and ridiculed from the outside when you feel like you're trying to live apart from the world. But it must be possible to at least challenge and criticize such communities, because of course we don't know what levels of, um, you know. Um, well, I don't want to put it too pejorative, oppression, you know, um, containment may operate within such communities too. And 
they ought not to be immune from challenge. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Dick. I really enjoyed that. And when you started out, I thought you might be heading towards a, a theory of regulation for religious content, religious content speech. And um, uh, that's actually where you didn't end up. And, mm -hmm. and I guess I gather from your presentation that for religiously based uh, uh, speech, it just, the situation just reverts to your views about hate speech generally because you've rejected the special case for religious content, which I think I agree with. But um, I, um, my question has to do with uh, the concept of the captive audience because mm -hmm. you can create a theory of captivity that is either very broad or very narrow. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in the, in the Ross case, for instance, um, the kids were captives within the school, but there was no evidence of any harm arising mm -hmm. from, in the school, arising from the extracurricular activities of the teacher. I think that's the way I remember the evidence. And then I'm sort of thinking about the, um, uh, you know, your comments about the state being neat neutral as between the speaker and the unwilling listeners. Um, and I'm sort of thinking, well, the religious uh, minority communities are actually the captives of the majority communities who are um, free to engage in disparaging commentary about them. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't know if it makes any sense, but I think there's something right. there in the concept of captivity and right. whether, you, you know, and if you define it as an exception to your general principle about how this should be handled, yeah. there's a lot of freight in how you handle that concept of captivity and whether it's Absolutely. a really, really broad one or whether it's really narrow because you could either end up with a highly, highly protective position for speech with a narrow mm -hmm. concept of captivity, or you could um, all but destroy the, the protection for speech or expressive activity if your concept of captivity is impossibly broad. So yeah. I just wondered if you had thoughts about that. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll notice how careful I was when I threw this in at the end to kind of say, this is something to think about because I'm, you know, I recognize that the risks involved with kind of opening the door to something like that at the same time, I think about you know, situations where you know, the members of a religious community, I, I, you know, I want to say, look, all kinds of things can, can be said. I might think, I hope people don't say them. You know, I should have added all that. I mean, we have to be respectful. But in terms of legal restriction, I think that there are not really workable restrictions and there's too much cost to try to restrict it and so forth. But at the same time, I can't get past the sense that Yes, people do you know, deeply and profoundly associate themselves with, you know, with a belief system. It's you know, critical to who they are, and it's deeply hurtful, and that we do have restrictions on offensive speech in public settings. That is to say, even just public nudity, for example. We do say you know, people should be protected from being confronted with certain things. And I, I want to at least take something away from I want to at least ground something in the notion that the identity, the identification with the religious beliefs is so deep and profound that maybe we should at least acknowledge it in this minor way, that I shouldn't have somebody come up to me in the most you know, direct way, unmediated fashion, and say horrible things in front of me or damage you know, that which I regard as worthy of veneration, burning the Quran, for example. But would your concept of captivity then be specific to religion? Yes, just, I think okay. so. So you wouldn't have captivity for other types of... I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, other kinds of hate speech. I mean, I think hate speech can be restricted. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm talking oh. about attacks on belief. That's the focus here. I'm, I'm, I still believe in hate okay, speech. Okay, so captivity Lost. is a special <laughs> protection for, uh, yes. for offensive speech that is religiously yes. based. Hi, thank you so much. I'm, um, with, especially with what you just said about the, the freedom to be um, not sort of in a direct, unmediated way attacked for your beliefs. Right. Uh, some of the, well, the examples of Mark Stein and Ezra Levant that you pointed out are um, specifically those mediated types where sort of the civility yeah. and the um, legitimacy of the critique has been sort of reinforced by the fact that it's being presented in a legitimate forum. Um, through, I mean, almost a, a megaphone, if you will, yep. uh, so that the audience, I mean, it's not um, an example of a rally where a hate speech is being made and then people are going out and riding. I mean, the, the effects of uh, audience actions on the base of the speech are 
I mean, as far away as, as Norway, as you pointed out. Yeah. So what uh, responsibility should those outlets, should those forums have um, right. when dealing with this sort of thing? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess I should, you know, make just a few things clear and also like <laughs> Jamie's question. I, be I, I believe we need to have hate speech laws. I mean, I believe that what ought to be restricted should be pretty extreme in character. I mean, the argument I've made elsewhere is that either explicitly or implicitly, one understands it as calling for extreme action violence. If you take seriously this message, what should be restricted? So I think that Stein, you know, particularly in this contemporary context, is probably appropriately restricted, you know, for example. So when, it's an when it can be understood as an attack on the religious community, as attributing certain things, I think it should be restricted. When we're talking about you know, the ridicule of beliefs or things that are sacred and so forth, I don't think those ought to be restricted. Now, what the media ought to do, I mean, maybe it doesn't much matter because it all circulates through the internet anyway, but what the media ought to do, well, I think re report it with some responsibility. I mean, we don't, generally speaking, most you know, mainstream media don't set out to publish things that are just willfully objectionable or offensive or hurtful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if I hear another person say, oh, well, as a matter of free speech, we should be protect to defend free speech, we should republish the Danish cartoons. He's thinking, you know, like, to what end? As if, as if that's in itself a reason. To have a right is not, as some have said, to have a reason to publish. And so, you know, what media should do in relation to that? Well, do I think they should republish them? Well, you know, I'm not going to decide for anybody, but I don't think it obviously follows, nor do I think that it is, um, you know, a kind of, we should be vindicating um, free speech by republishing what might be offensive and hurtful to people. I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think there's a lot of complicated questions. And these days, what we mean by mediated, unmediated is complicated, obviously, around, uh, around the internet, and all of this circulates uh, in that form. Please go ahead. We have time for one or two more questions. Okay. I'm sorry that you, we didn't get to talk more about uh, religion as the source of hate speech, because it seems well, you to you can ask me a question. I, yeah, so because then. it seems to me that the two um, are inseparable, and, well, largely inseparable, and especially uh, going off of Professor Ryder's comments, you know, the idea of part of um, hate speech laws being uh, uh, to prevent discrimination, um, it seems to me that a lot of religious texts have in them some mm -hmm. very discriminatory. I sure. mean, <laughs> I'm I, I'm an atheist, so I definitely. Anyways, won't even get into that. But if you could just talk a little bit, maybe about the connection between um, religion as the source and the subject. Well, the source and the subject. I mean, I. I rather talk about it at large in the sense that, of course, when religion is the source, it's often the source of hateful speech against other religious communities. That's true. But, you know, significantly, I suppose, in contemporary, um, you know, Canadian cases, it's the source of, you know, anti-gay and lesbian speech, you know, that's significantly. Not yeah. Well, that's true, too. <laughs> that's true, too. I guess I'm thinking about, you know, cases that have, cases that have arisen for example. And I mean, what I'd say about it is I think there are, you know, two issues that in some sense are the kind of mirror image of what I described when talking about the problems um, with making the distinction between belief and believer in the context of attacks on, on religion. And, and the first is nicely illustrated, I think, by the Owens case. And that is you have, you know, you have scripture that says, you know, horrendous things, there's awful things. And, but then you have that question of, well, what do the what does the religious community or what do individual believers understand that text to mean? How do they take it? How do they adopt it? What use do they make of it? And in the Owens case, as you may know, where I'll say it just briefly a little bit about the case in case people don't know it, Mr. Owens had published ads in the Saskatoon Star Phoenix that um, you know uh, well had two things. One was the um, uh, a kind of um, image of two stick men holding hands with a forbidden you know, sign through it. And then it had reference to uh, a number of uh, biblical verses, including the verse from Leviticus that says, man shall not lie with man and should be put to death. You know. And so the question was whether or not this counted as hate speech, contrary to the Saskatoon Code. It went all the way to the 
the uh, uh, Saskatchewan Court of Appeal, and they said, you know, we can't, you know, we can't automatically assume that he understood this in a literal fashion. Now, obviously, he understands some things literally. He believes that it forbids uh, same-sex relationships, but not the kind of stoning put to death element of it. So you get that problem of, well, what do people believe and what is there associated with, with, with a scripture and with a religious tradition? And there's always lots of space to kind of decide that, well, they don't really think that. And certainly the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal didn't want to be understood as saying that the Bible was hate speech. You know, they wouldn't be saying that. They'd be saying an individual's reading of the Bible might be understood as, as hateful. I think that's one problem, but it also points to the other problem, and that is I think the court's very uh, deep reluctance to be seen as um, criticizing a widely held religious belief. So if a number of people believe that um, you know, homosexuality is sinful as a result of you know, what, what the Bible may say, the religious tradition, however much that might be at odds, with uh, you know, public morality. I mean, what we have established you know, now under the Charter, Human Rights Codes, and so forth, you can see the court's reluctance to find that, to find that to be the case, because they're supposed to be neutral towards religion, which I, you know, I think has a whole set of problems with it. And I think the other dimension of, of the relationship between you know, religion as source is, of course, that you know, the Kind of the faith-based understanding, the authority of religious leaders, you know, religious, um, religious traditions, you know, have um, much in them around myths of persecution, myths of violent redemption, and so forth. And there is certainly, you know, plenty of opportunity or space to employ religion and the authority structure within any particular religious relationship um, to, you know, dangerous or harmful ends where the individual doesn't necessarily stand apart and make an individual judgment, but you know, is more inclined to respect or follow an authority figure's views and so forth. So I think there are a whole range of issues that that gives rise to. I don't know whether that... Uh, well, Dick, we're, you're we're out of time. I'm gonna, everyone, we're gonna be uh, thanking Professor Mumo. Oh, I get First something? All, you get oh my God. <laughs> black poster. Goodness me, that's uh, thank, amazing. Thank you very much, Dick. And well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.